Some people claim that the 1981 Mako 490 Mega 2 is the greatest dirt bike of all time. Or at the very least, they say that this bike was the king of kings for open class competition. My name is Max, this is 999 Laser, and we're here at the Tough Sheet Twin Shock Championship to find out if this beauty is as good as they said. years ago, almost to the day, iconic German motorcycle manufacturer Mako unveiled a machine that would become their magnum opus, their ultimate masterpiece. The 1981 Mako 490 Mega 2 stunned the motocross world upon its release. Bike testers around the world gushed about the insane yet usable power provided by the two-stroke motor and the general public clambered over each other to get a hold of one of these magnificent German whips. At the time, Mako were considered to be like the Porsche or the Mercedes of the dirt bike world. And in 1981, more Mako 490s were sold than Honda's entire motocross range. And in the decades since its release, the bike has only become more legendary. Motocross Action's Jody Weisel was even quoted as saying that the Mako 490 had the best handling and the best power band in motocross history. But what was it about this bike that made the testers of the time write such glowing reviews? And do those reasons still hold up today? Let's find out. We're here at Bevercut today with Pete Mafia, Brad O'Leary and Bill Brown and they're going to let us know what it feels like to wrangle 490 cc's of German excellency. Before we hit the track though, let's take a look at the bike in more detail, have a look at the specifications and hear what the testers of the time had to say beyond their initial rants and raves. This video is being sponsored by the awesome guys at Earpiece. As you've just heard, the dirt bike track isn't the quietest of environments. Across the globe, approximately 360 million people are affected by hearing loss. But what does that have to do with dirt bikes and motocross racing? Well, it's been proven that any sound over 85 decibels can be harmful. And how loud is your average motocross bike? It's about 94, 95 decibels. That's loud. Don't you find it weird that in a sport where we have all of this expensive gear to keep us protected and our bodies as healthy as possible, we choose to neglect a part of our anatomy that, if lost or seriously damaged, would truly be life-changing. A broken arm is certainly easier to fix than permanent ear damage. For now though, let me just quickly tell you about the brand new Moto Pro Earplug by Earpiece, which has already launched in the US and is launching in the UK on the 1st of August. This is the latest in earplug technology for motorsports. The Moto Pro is a painted contoured earplug that fits comfortably underneath your helmet for hours. It provides true to life sound at a safer volume. It lowers wind noise to maintain situational awareness. They come in multiple sizes and feature several different noise reduction filters to choose from. If you want to find out more about Earpiece and the Moto Pro product, check out the links in the description down below. A big thank you goes to Earpiece for supporting the channel and getting us to the races. Now on with the story. For years, the Mako 450 was the horsepower king. But in 1980, Yamaha released the YZ465, which toppled Mako from the top of the power pile. The YZ put out 42 horsepower compared to Mako's measly 40. The Germans weren't too pumped about this, so they went away to try and design the meanest, fastest, most powerful big bore bike they could. And that's how the 490 was born. Reportedly, Mako were looking for 50 horsepower plus, and some numbers from the time claim that the Mega 2 put out 53 HP. However, some more reliable sources from the time say that the 1981 Mako 490 put out 47.2 on the dyno. But nevertheless, for the early 1980s, that's still mightily impressive. As a result of that horsepower battle, the bike was fast. Very fast. Teslas of the time said that the power was straight and smooth, but demanded respect at all times. They say that with stop gearing, the 490 was capable of 80 miles per hour, which was more than enough to outdrag any of its rivals. 
terms of handling and rideability, the 81490 had a swing arm that was two inches longer than the previous model, which greatly improved stability and returned the tremendous handling to the bike that Mako were always famed for. The 490 was renowned for being able to cut low on the corners, being able to make easy passes on its heftier foes. The foot pegs were higher and set further back to improve overall ergonomics. The bars were flatter and higher with a slimmer and flatter seat for a more modern feel. A new airbox, fender and side panels completed the new look for the 1981 model and gave the 490 Mega 2 its iconic appearance. The bike had Corte and Cosso shocks from Italy and although they wasn't the most popular, they were said to be better than previous years. At 224.7 pounds, the 490 was by far the lightest open class bike of the time, over 20 pounds lighter than the competition. But the Mako was also expensive, over 20% more expensive than the competition. I believe that the bike cost about 2,690 odd dollars back in 1981. But as time wears on, these bikes are only becoming more and more legendary. In 2018, a fine specimen of a 490 was sold at a Las Vegas auction for a reported $16,500. That's not a bad investment at all. As I've mentioned already in this video, the bike testers of the time raved about this bike unlike anything I've seen before. Rick Simon from Offroad.com concluded his review by saying, Not much question about it. The Mega 2 490 Mako is the finest, fastest, best handling open class motocrosser we've ever ridden to date. I think he might have enjoyed that bike just a little bit. So far, we've been very kind to the Mako. But of course, she wasn't without her flaws, but we'll get to those in a bit. For now, let's hit the track and experience the immense power of this German brute. So the riders are lined up for race one of the expert twin shot class. Two riders to watch out for, the number two of Brad O'Leary and the 119 of Jimmy Marginson. The gates have dropped. Who's gonna grab the first hole shot of the day? Number 98 machine, Richard Mason with a flying start, closely followed by the flying Jimmy Margotson. Another rider on the Mako 490 Mega 2, as is Brad O'Leary. But it's Mason leading the way at the moment, but oh, Margotson tries to make a move. Mason fights back to reclaim the race lead. It's all action at the start of Moto 1. Oh, Mason goes down on the slippy grass section going down the hill, but he remounts still in the lead. Banging bars with Jimmy Margotson. And this has allowed Brad O'Leary to sneak out the inside and claim the race lead here on the opening lap. So Brad O'Leary on the 1981 Mako 490 Mega 2 is the new race leader. Jimmy Margotson into second now ahead of Richard Mason. So the battle is on between Margotson and O'Leary. Oh, a slight mistake for Brad O'Leary there, losing the back end. Margotson is looking to bounce, but Brad O'Leary defends well. Brad O'Leary, stable in the lead at the moment. But the young gun, Jimmy Margotson, will be looking to pull the trigger to try and make a pass for the race lead. He will not want the election. Brad O'Leary to run away with things at the front of the pack. O'Leary a multiple time AMCA champion, remember. Marguson trying to go up the inside but can't make the move stick there as they do come round to complete lap number one here in Moto1, the first race of the day. Look at them scrubbing those old bikes. You wouldn't believe that these are 40 year old machines. Top of the hill, O'Leary leads. Marguson still right there, lurking, waiting, ready to pounce. Fantastic old school circuit we've got here today at Beaver Coats. Perfect for the Tough Sheet Twin Shot Championship. O'Leary starting to stretch away slightly. He's got a couple of bike lengths over Margaretson now here in the first moto of the day. The number two machine looking mighty fine out there on the mighty Mako machine. Powering up the hill he goes. Fast and back markers now, so working into lap traffic. Tight chicane here. 
Cleary on the gas. Oh, look at that, a mistake for Margotson. A slight mistake for Jimmy Markson has allowed Brad O'Leary to run away with things at the front of the pack. He's got a nice advantage now over Jimmy Margotson, the second place rider. So all Brad O'Leary needs to do is complete one more lap here at Beaver Coach, all alone at the front of the pack. So one more lap to go for Brad O'Leary and this win will be his as long as he can keep it on two wheels for the remainder of this lap. Half a lap to go now for Brad O'Leary. Riding a bike from the collection of Bill Brown, Mr. Mako himself. As is Jimmy Margotson and Ben Margotson also. So plenty of Bill Brown's Makos out there today. A handful of corners left to go for Brad O'Leary in this moto then. The number two machine charging up the hill for the final time. Just two corners left. Down the hill he goes. He's about to take the check flag for the first time here today. Brad O'Leary takes first blood. So Brad, just talk us through race one, good start. Is it a race lead early, uh, is it? Average start, yeah, I was like third, uh, third or fourth, put my way through the third. And the leader actually crashed, oh, tight really? hairpin. Was that Jimmy or someone no, else? No, I landed on a 490 Honda. He, he actually crashed, but because the track was quite tight, he managed to get back on back in the lead. <laughs> um, so what, he held everyone up? Yeah, 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 so he got back on and then him and Jimmy kind of came together and I was sort of pounced. On the first, on the Took the lead, lap, yeah. first lap, yeah, and just got my head down, got a few laps in. Jimmy was coming. Yeah, and I he think made he, a mistake. He'd come top. off. Yeah, yeah it, a little one, it locked on the back end. Yeah. At that top of this hill here. It's just, it, it, it was still really, really slick. Jimmy made that mistake, so he kind of gave me a few seconds breathing space, and I could see him then. I could kind of govern and him. You get, was he pretty much the same? Like pretty much, yeah, yeah. I got a bit of give and take, really, with. You know, I make a mistake, he make a mistake, whatever. And with it only being six lap race, maybe it was ideal for me. Yeah. <laughs> so ideal. Get started. Uh, fingers crossed, yeah, trying to get a good start. I can't get a better start this one. I, I had to feather the clutch a bit, so I lost a couple of split seconds coming out the gate, but <laughs> give it a good go again. Yeah, good man. We've just been on board with him, but who is Brad O'Leary? Well, he's a three time AMCA champion and a former Imba European racer. We are now going to chat with Brad and a couple of other Mako men to find out what it's like to tame this beast and ask why they go twin shock racing. I like the pace of the twin shock. You still feel like you're going 100 mile an hour, but you're not. And you still have a good crack and there's still some really good racing. And you get to ride the tracks that I liked to ride when I was younger. So there's no huge jumps, there's a bit of grass, there's a few off cambers into some real fast bits as well. So yeah, it's a good it's a good mixture of tracks really. If you could look into this camera, okay. introduce yourself and your relationship with Mako. Ooh, how long have you got? Oh right, uh, hello, yes, I'm Bill Brown from Wolf Sport. Uh, been involved with Mako since, since early 70s, uh, repairing, servicing. Uh, mid 70s as a dealer for Brian Goss. 83 took over the importer ship when Michael went bankrupt at that time. But Michael's got a hell of a fan club throughout the world, Max. So I realised there's a demand for parts. I enjoyed riding them myself. I just find everybody that ever rode one would always go back and ride one again. They always had a soft spot for them. In the 90s, we bought, I think, about 60 tonnes of Michael parts from the factory, yeah, when, when they closed finally. The good thing about that was, we knew what there was plenty of, and we knew what there was none of, we knew what there was a few of, so we've had to get so much of it remanufactured. It makes sense from a business point of view, but even a personal interest point of view. I enjoy riding the bikes myself. They're very forgiving. They've, they've got a secret that I can tell you about. Lots of people have got their own crackpot theories 
of why the bikes are forgiving, why it's so good. There's a lot of them think it's the porting, they think it's the tuning, they think it's the fork angle, they think it's the handling. The Michael Secret basically is power delivery and I think if you speak to any good tuner they'll tell you there's no substitute for inertia in an engine. You can put them on a dyno, you can get fantastic power, but if it's not putting on the ground, you're wasting time. The secret, my theory is, the primary chain, where you have a clutch working with the crankshaft, so you've got the clutch as an extra flywheel. The minute you go to primary gear drive, the clutch goes backwards, so not only do you lose it as a flywheel, it's working against you. So they've kept the primary chain, whereas with the later Micos, they went on the primary gear drive and effectively you've got a CR500 Honda, which is fantastic if you're fantastic. But if you're not, that hard work, you, you fight the bike really, Max. That, that's my theory, <laughs> for what it's worth, yeah. What is it like to ride these old Mega 2? Um, so we've... <laughs> With a few different engines, slightly ported, slightly different as well. And the one I'm on today is a really smooth power delivery, so you can ride it really quite hard on like a slippery surface. So like it's ideal on the grass. So it's not aggressive. Wow, well, I'm saying it's not aggressive. It's it's 490 two stroke, so it's aggressive, but it's it's rideable and usable. Not so aggressive out the gate, which I might suffer a bit with, but I prefer just to feel more comfortable on the track. Uh, yeah, I was quite surprised the first time I got on them. When you sit on them, you can have a sit on yourself. It's really plush, really nice and soft, really. And that's all right until you start to go a bit faster and a bit of this. So sometimes you have to run no sag to get the springs that hard and fill them full of air, fill them full of oil. And But they're old, they're 40 year old nearly, so you know, you, you lose your air, you lose a bit of oil. And But handling wise, it's it's a lovely bike to ride and race. Um, honestly, I've got not one bad word to say about them. Power delivery is half your handling. You know, how it puts that power out the ground besides how the bike's going to ride. If that's kicking in and catching you out all the time, you're gonna, it's going to shatter your confidence a bit. If you can stick that bike into a corner and give it a big handful and it just drives you out, you're going to be in love with it. You know, and that's that's the secret of it. Another thing you've got to remember is they don't have a rev limiter. So you get a lot of the young guys that have been brought up with a rev limiter. The engine tells them when to change gear. The trouble is with the Michael, they don't have a rev limiter. Maximum power is 6,000 revs. They'll rev to nine and a half, but the last three and a half thousand revs, you're going nowhere. All the damage is done in the last three and a half thousand revs. You've got to remember to change gear. I've read some Mako sold more 490s in 1981 than yeah. Honda sold across the entire dirt bike range. Were they really that popular back in the day? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, even you look at a British championship in the late 70s, half the lineup were Mako. And the way the riders were, if you could get a free bike, you rode what you could get. Or if you got paid to ride a bike, you rode exactly that. But if you had to buy a bike, there was only one bike to buy. Even the likes of Pete. He had some fantastic deals on other bikes, but Pete never ever rode the bike of the day. He always rode an unpopular bike, but since 83, he's been on Michael and he's never looked back. We still have him, he's never missed a season in that time. I started in 1968, I graduated to GPs in 76, I did GPs for until 1980 basically, and, and obviously British Championships and whatnot. Uh, my best position in the GP was the fourth but I never actually managed to win one, which was a bit uh, annoying. But you needed good bikes as well. And then the twin shocks took off in, I think, in 92. So it gave you a second chase at the cake, didn't it? I think I won about seven or eight Masters Championships, about four or five twin shock GPs. Uh, I started doing some classics through the year. I'm currently the over 60s European champion, two years on the trot. So, no, still going. I started riding Michaels in 1984 and I've never stopped. I think the 1981 Michael was possibly the best motocross bike ever made and I just wish I'd been on it in 1981. I think the geometry for one thing is good but the other thing is the engine. It's very torquey and everyone basically copied it. Hondas, Kawasaki's. If you take a triangle from the handlebars to the footrest to the seat and make a triangle you'll find they're all the set. They all copied it. 
So they, Michael's had something right, didn't they? Obviously, the reviews are growing, but there are some niggles and stuff. Oh. What, what have you experienced? Riding these bikes nearly 40 years now, what have you experienced with, with these bikes? The trouble is it's sort of a bit hand-built bike, so lots of parts, you need to modify them and clean them up and alter them a little bit, because you buy a Japanese bike, a part fits perfect. Not quite the same with the Mikos. The other thing is you've got to change primary chains quite often. But basically, no, I've not found that much to worry about. Obviously there's no brakes on them, <laughs> but there never was. I've never experienced a weekend without issues as yet. <laughs> so it's stay off your clutch, don't rev it too hard, run the correct fuel, keep them cool. There are lots of things to go wrong because they're, like I said, they're 40 years old and they've had some stick. So, you know, they're original casings, you know, original forks. That is one of the things, everything has to be rubber mounted really because there's so much vibration. But, <laughs> It's just part of the challenge really, and you can't let it ruin your day. It's about riding the bike and dealing with the issues that, that it you know, throws at you. The bike that Brad's riding, and the Margotson boys, is exactly the same geometry as the 81. Again, they found the optimum. So if I change it, I'm going to muck it up. People will tell you if they move the engine forward or the engine back, or if they do this, if they do that it'll make it better, but I mean, arguably, if you get a 50 pence piece and you file the corners off, it'll fit in a 10 pence slot machine, and it will. But, you know, what's the point? No, the, the, the bike that Brad rides, the plastic on Brad's bike, the side panels are the same as 81. The tank's different in the seat. It's narrower, it's lower, and you can get up the tank more to ride it. But otherwise, the frame, everything else, same as 81. 40 years old this bike now. Yeah. How do you think it would compare to a modern bike? Do you still ride modern bikes at all? I do still ride modern bikes. It's plusher than a modern bike. Power-wise, the 490 still can do 55 brake horse. You know, at the end of the day, I think a good top rider, if he set the suspension up, would still do a good lap time. I think there's no doubt about it, really. I mean, they had the optimum in 81. They got everything dead right. And I mean, even now, with a half decent rider could take it out in a modern race and on a 40 year old bike will still give a good account of myself. You look at the lap times today and you'll find there's very little difference between 81 Micros with the likes of the Margots and lads and the likes of Brad. There'll be very little difference in lap times between them. You know. So probably three or four weeks ago I did a modern race here on the Mako in the Expert of gating third or fourth and holding my own probably about fourth or fifth but power delivery compared to a modern bike it, it, it's still off it to be honest it, it, the modern 450 are just in my opinion a bit too much for the for the normal expert yeah just a bit too much but these are perfect there's no you notice everyone's smiling everyone's smiling yeah. 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 race two for the expert twin shot class is up next there's our Start man who's been doing the starts here for 25 years. And the gates have dropped. Who will be grabbing the whole shot here? Moto number two. Looks like a good jump from Brad O'Leary. But Jimmy Martinson fights. Using those wide elbows to steal the whole shot away from Brad O'Leary. But it's race on now. Margotson versus O'Leary, round two. They scrub over the tabletop for the first time and up the grass hill. All guns blazing. The battle of the two Makos now. Both riding 1981 490s. Margotson is going to look to try and run away with the race lead here. Oh, O'Leary on the inside. Oh, the back end slides out. He managed to hang on to it. But he's lost a spot to Richard Mason, the number 98 machine in that exchange. So O'Leary lost the back end up the hill, lost traction and has lost a position. So Brad O'Leary demoted to third place. Oh, Mason all over the shop at the moment. Part of our action to kick off race number two here for the expert twin shot class. 
Jimmy Margitson setting a furious pace out in front of the field at the moment. O'Leary down the inside of Mason. Can he make it stick? Not this side. Mason fights back to reclaim second position. What a start to this moto. This is awesome. O'Leary desperately searching for a place to make a move. Looking for a place to make the pass. Where can he make it happen? Oh, aggressive from Brad O'Leary up the inside of Richard Mason. And just like that, he steals away second position from the Honda man. And now he's got his sights set on the race leader, Jimmy Margitson. So the 119 machine has got to watch out because Brad O'Leary is on the move. He's rapidly catching the rear wheel of the race leader. So it's game on, race on. Margitson versus O'Leary, round two is back on. Just like that, onto the rear fender of Jimmy Margotson. So he's made up ground, close in onto the rear wheel of the race leader. He's eating a face full of roost and desperately searching for another place to make another blast. Oh, look how close it is now over the tabletop. These two guys absolutely on the gas, putting on the show. O'Leary takes another face full of roost. This is real old school motocross right now. This is awesome. They charge up the hill. Wheel to wheel action between Margaretson and O'Leary. And O'Leary sneaking up the inside. This is where he made the move on Richard Mason earlier. Couldn't make it stick that time, but has he done this time? Yes, he has. Brad O'Leary into the race lead. A nice line up the inside of Jimmy Margaretson to take over that leading position. So the number two of Brad O'Leary is the new race leader. Can he hang on to it? Jimmy Margaretson is fighting back hard. He's not gonna roll over quite so easily. And it's the last lap. One lap to go for Brad O'Leary. One lap left in this thriller of a moto. And Jimmy Margaretson still right there, still right on the rear wheel of Brad O'Leary. He loses a little bit of traction up the hill, but he's still there, ready and waiting to bounce. With well, just a few more corners to go, a handful more corners to go. This race look like, looks like it's Brad O'Leary's to lose. No, oh, he's down! Brad O'Leary goes down. He loses the front end in the corner. Jimmy Marcuson looks over. He can't quite believe it. And Brad O'Leary gets that mighty Mako fired up. Can he get rolling in second position? Yes, it looks like... He remains in second position, just ahead of Ben Margotson. So the second Margotson boy, there he is, just behind Brad O'Leary. Brad O'Leary throws away the lead on the final lap, but somehow manages to hold on to second position. This all goes down to moto number three. Brad, race two, ups and downs, just talk us through it. Yeah, good start. I've, yeah. I've seen your technique now. I stood at the start there. I see it. <laughs> Sneaky Neil Prince move, that is. Sneaky little, you know, bit of experience yeah. there. Um, yeah, that one got red flagged and then restart. Slightly worse start second. Slightly time. worse. Me Still and, up there, though. Me and Jimmy giving each other big elbows up the straight. Um, took a start few. Back end proper. I tried to make a big move up that hill and it just. I was going up the hill sideways and I, yeah. I thought it's going to. Yeah, gonna, you, that was like. I thought I was going to get injection, yeah. yeah. So, set two, got back up to Jimmy, past Jimmy. Really good race, wasn't it? Loved it, yeah, yeah. I was getting filled in, got past him, last lap. Silly, silly mistake yeah, down I there. I didn't get on camera, but I no, saw it, I just looked good. over, I saw Yeah, it. no, I just lost the front. It stalled, I had to restart it. And of course, they're, they're, they're tricky enough to kick yeah. as it is, let alone when you're tired and it's hot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I've still got a second, but I was... Enjoyed that one on the first one, yeah, even though was I was good, second. Good, so good to watch. It's a good race. and So now it's when it takes off. Yeah, I might have to make those elbows a bit bigger. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Today, the Mako 490 may look and ride like an antique. After all, dirt bike technology has evolved massively in the past 40 years. But there's no doubting the legendary status of this icon of motocross history. The Mako 490 was and remains an important motorcycle for multiple reasons. 
This bike proved to be the last gasp for the old world of motocross, the last breath for the once mighty and dominant European brands. As we know, the early days of dirt bikes were dominated by the likes of BSA, CZ, Husqvarna and Mako. But in the late 1970s, the Japanese began to rise as a new dirt bike superpower and the Europeans struggled to compete. It may have only been for a year or two, but the 1981 Mako 490 was able to stem that total Japanese invasion for a little while longer. The Mako 490 was probably also the last truly great twin shock machine. 1981 served as the end of the twin shock era, as the rapidly evolving suspension landscape trended towards a single shock future. For many people, the 490 was just about as good as a twin shocker could or would ever get. And finally, in many people's opinion, the 490 was as near perfect as Mako would ever get as well. The bike marked the pinnacle of their success, both financially and in terms of overall design. Sadly, the Germans would never reach those heights again. The Mako 490 will live on forever for all of these reasons and more. And I believe that there's many people around the world just like Pete, just like Brad and just like Bill, real, true, honest fans that will painstakingly keep the legacy of this icon alive for future generations to enjoy. Mako created a machine that can truly be argued as being one of the greatest dirt bikes ever made. But where are they now? How does a company capable of that, a company so closely associated with vintage motocross, almost just completely disappear off the face of the earth? What the hell happened? Well, I can tell you, it's a wild ride. The almost unbelievable story of Mako's rise, fall and death is a tale of Nazis, civil war and grenading gearboxes. I will dive into that saga in a future video. But for now, before all of that drama, let's just bask in the glory of the 490 one last time. It's winner takes all. Brad O'Leary and Jimmy Markson have one win apiece. So the victor of this moto will decide the overall podium for the day. Watch out for the likes of Ben Markson and Richard Mason as well. Two riders capable of throwing a spanner in the works. Who's going to grab the third and final hole shot of the afternoon? A great jump from Brad O'Leary up the hill. Oh, but Margaretson sneaks up the inside along with Ben Margaretson. So we've got Jimmy and Ben, the two Margaretson boys. One and two at the moment. Brad O'Leary has got some work to do. Jimmy Margaretson has got some help at the front of the pack this time. So Brad O'Leary is going to have to make some quick quick move on Ben Margerson if he wants to keep Jimmy in his sights. If he wants to claim this overall victory, he needs to finish in front of Jimmy Margerson, who currently leads the race on this opening lap of action. O'Leary onto the rear wheel of Ben Margerson now, the 116 machine. Another rider on a 1981 Mako 490. So we've got three Makos in the top three positions right now. Just going to show how mighty these machines really are. So across the line for the first time in this race. It's Jimmy Markson leading Ben Markson. Brad O'Leary rounds out the top three. As we said, O'Leary needs to make a quick move on Ben Markson. He wants to keep Jimmy in his sights. Track dusty, slick now. Charging down the hill they come. Here comes Brad O'Leary, switches to the inside on the gas. A lovely move from Brad O'Leary to take over second position there then. So Brad O'Leary into second, Ben Margotson down into third. And O'Leary now has his sights set on the race leader. The target is Jimmy Margotson. What can he do? Just a handful of laps left to go. It's the final lap now, so one lap left. Four, Brad O'Leary and Jimmy Margotson. 
Is there anything Brad O'Leary can do about the race leader, Jimmy Margotson? It's close, but not quite close enough just yet. Up the hill they go for the final time on the gas. Absolutely big on these four 90 Makos. O'Leary quick into the chicane. Closes in on the rear wheel of Margotson. It's close, as close as it's been all moto long. Margotson's quick around this back section of the track. He's real quick. With just a few corners to go, it looks like Jimmy Margotson has broken away from Brad O'Leary. Margotson, this race looks to be his. Up the hill for the final time today. Margotson, a good couple of bike links over Brad O'Leary. And it looks like it's exuberance, beaten experience here today. Jimmy Margotson takes the win ahead of Brad O'Leary. But it's three Mako 490s on the podium. Brad, last race, talk us through it, mate. Um, great jump off the gate. Yeah, really good. Really cheeky good. little, <laughs> cheeky little look. I thought for sure you had the whole yeah, shot to get a big, I don't know. Yeah, you had uh, half a bite left on him. Maybe I hung on that gear a bit long, uh, and then got to the turn. Yeah. Jimmy gave us a big elbow. Um, it was, it, uh, the the market seems ganged up on you, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, so they both got through. A um, couple of laps to get Ben. And a really short uh, and, race, and, isn't it? Yeah, really a bit of a short. sprint, but no, I loved it. Brilliant day. Um, great fun. And the bikes held together. Yeah. We've all held together. So. Well, Bill, Bill Brown this morning said to yeah. me, oh, it'll be interesting to look at your lap times compared to the modern bikes. So what are they? I don't know what... I don't... So, I've not seen the last race, yeah. but in the first race, you did... The guy who won the, the, uh, on the modern bike, on a YZ250, did a 219. You did a 214. 14? I've not looked all day, yeah, yeah. And then in race two... I he felt did, quick he in the did race two. Yeah. You did 212. Yeah, I felt quick in the race two. You were two seconds out quicker than Jimmy in that one. Yeah, well. I felt really quick in race two. It all come together. So that just, for me, just proves how good that bike is. No, so we'll, we'll, we'll do another one and we'll... We'll choose a meeting and do some more. We'll do some more. Yeah, yeah that sounds we'll, like a we'll cause some trouble. Right, Brad, Thank you very much, mate. Take care. Nice Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. As I mentioned, part two of the Mako story will be coming to the channel soon. A big shout out goes to Nathan Harris for watching the videos and supporting the channel. As always guys, my name's Max, this is 999 Laser, and until next time, I'll see you at the track. Once again, a massive thank you goes to Earpiece for supporting the channel and sponsoring this video. Remember to check out the Moto Pro earplugs, there's a link in the description down below.